Welcome to the Manuscript Academy podcast, brought to you by a writer and an agent who both believe that education is key. The beauty is the people you meet along the way, and that community makes all the difference. Here at the Manuscript Academy, you can learn the skills, make the connections, and have access to experts all from home. I'm Julie Kingsley. And I'm Jessica Sinsheimer. Put down your pens, pause your word counts, and enjoy. Hello, everybody. We have a very special experimental episode for you today. We met Julia, who is a writer who has gone through three rounds of revisions, each one leaps and bounds ahead of the last. And we're so proud of her. And we wanted to talk with her about the process and how that happened, and hopefully showing you some queries that went from good to better to, I think, pretty great. Um, can show you the things that a query letter needs and teach you some lessons along the way. So Julia, tell us about you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I genuinely looked forward to this all week. I am 23 and I am currently in a master's program right now um, at, a, at a college in my state. And so I go to school full time and then I write all the other times, <laughs> like a lot of people who are juggling probably what they would refer to as their real lives with their writing lives. So this is is not my first book I've written. I've written um, three or four now, but this is the one that at this point I feel the most confident in and the one that I'd say I've put the most work into as far as the querying process and really making sure my query is at the same level as the book that I've worked forever on. I love that so much. So tell us where you are in the process. So you've done three queries. Have you queried out? Are you waiting? Like, tell us how that all that's going. Yeah, so I haven't queried yet. I have done three query critiques with Jessica, which have, as she alluded to, completely, in my mind, transformed the query and really helped me a lot. Before that, I had previous meetings with agents through the Manuscript Academy. And of course, I've gone through friends who are writers, as well as um, my twin sister, who helps a lot with writing. And so I've been working on this query for a while. And I kept getting feedback from both uh, friends who are writers, as well as the agents I met with. And they were saying things like, this is a good query. This is a solid query. And I thought, great. But you know how many submissions agents are getting all the time? I'd like to go a little beyond solid, a little beyond good. And when I met with Jessica, she just really emphasize that this was a solid query. It was good, but we could make it better. And we could really emphasize certain aspects of it to make it better. And I think that that's really what I've held on to throughout this process is what really needs to be in there. Can you tell us a little bit more about how your twin sister helps you write? Yes, absolutely. So her name is Caitlin and we are best friends. We actually live together and we've been best friends since birth. So it's just a phenomenal partner to have in any aspect, but it's far as writing, she's been invaluable. She read my first draft. She's been with me since high school when I started really seriously writing books. And, you know, I was that kid in high school that would sit in class reading through the guide to literary agents and everybody knew I was writing a book. I even queried a few agents in high school. Probably a good thing that, that didn't go anywhere, but I did. So she was has been there from the beginning and she really helps with those initial drafts. Now that I'm a little bit more experienced, she gets to read more polished drafts. So I think that's a little more fun for her, but she's instrumental in helping with editing ideas and as well as the query process. Whenever I get feedback with my query, Jessica, after our meetings, she's the first person I go to and we brainstorm together and we say, okay, what can we, what can we do? How can we fix this? So she's a great partner to have. She actually loves researching agents as well. So that's a part that she really enjoys doing. Which for me, I think even the bravest writer is intimidated by the querying process. So to have somebody also so dedicated, it's amazing. She sounds like an agent, an agent, and an agent in the making. Oh my gosh, what a phone of you! Is that a would be writer, so cool. And one of you turns into an agent. <laughs> Oh, we've talked about that. She definitely says she's always like, I want Jessica's job. <laughs> she doesn't, but <clears throat> anyway. No, I know. She's, she's a little hesitant. I told her, I was like, you know, I'm not sure you really do. It's much more difficult than you than you know. But you never know. Okay, so you have the solid query. You're getting feedback that it is solid, but it's not singing as you would prefer that yes, it does. Absolutely. So I think there's this interesting part of the querying process where you get to a place where you have a draft that it is solid. And for some reason, I'm thinking about it, maybe because I need to do this. I'm thinking about it in terms of organizing your closet. You look at it, you open the doors, you're like, oh, it's basically fine. Nothing's falling on me. But then you're like, oh, I'll change this thing and then I'll change this thing. And before you know it, everything's on the floor. And you're like, what have I done? 
but the, everything on the floor is kind of the necessary stage for getting to where you are, that you open the doors, everything is where, where it is that it should be, everything's ironed, your shoes are all laid out, maybe you even have some cute lights that turn on when you open the doors. I want those. <laughs> Kids on TikToks, where that they're easy to get on Amazon, we'll find out. But yeah, I think it's so interesting that you have to go through this phase of like breaking everything into pieces to reassemble it again. Can you talk about like where you started and what some of those pieces were? Yes. And I really loved that analogy because it really was like I was just putting everything on the floor and looking at it. Because I think you'll see from the, the first one that I did with you, it's just everything's in there. And I think it was, there came a point where I needed to decide what could be cut, which I think is pretty normal. Everybody just tries to cram everything in there. And I, of course, I still have a, a longer query. I would say it's a little bit longer than maybe some people who really, really pare it down, but it's fantasy. So that's to be expected. But I think for me, the things that really stood out to me in the meetings were imagery. So that was something that I really wanted to include. I was saying things like she has magic or there's a fantasy cruise ship, but I wasn't necessarily showing those things. And so I think that was something I really held on to in continuous drafts was trying to actually show what I was saying. And then just that there's a lot of uncertainty in querying, I think, and a lot of uncertainty in creating that query. So something that one person tells you this needs to be in there, somebody else is going to say it doesn't. So you have to listen to yourself in some ways and also make sure that the person that you're getting to critique your query, you really trust. And I think that that's something that happened for me with you, Jessica. I just, because you were so encouraging, because you really took time with me so much time with me, way more time than I ever expected. Um, I was able to really trust that you cared where this was going. So that was something I really kept in mind was making sure that I trusted the critiques I was getting and made sure I was still listening to my voice, but also implementing that imagery and keeping the query more focused. I think it's so curious too. So you go into these situations with any, any beta reader, whether it's an agent or an editor or, you know, an industry professional or a friend or a sister, like, did you have a sense of what was wrong with it prior to, or did Jessica just come at you with things you hadn't even thought of? I think it was a mix of both. I think I knew, I would read it and I would tell Caitlin, I would say, I like it, but I don't love it. I would say, I love my book. You, Caitlin loves my book. I should be saying that about the query. This is all they might read. So I wanted to be as excited about the query as I was about the book, which we all know is somewhat impossible, but at least get close, right? So that was important to me. But I think there was a, a couple turning points for me where Jessica was really the one to suggest something that I hadn't seen myself. And one of those turning points was just determining what the pitch of the book was. And I think I remember saying to her at some point, I said, well, you know, because my the pitch of my book is that it's a magical cruise ship. And she kind of paused and she said, well, that's fun and that's exciting. Don't get me wrong. But there's actually something more here. And I think really me diving into the character's journey and who she was in her world, that was more of the pitch than necessarily the fantastical place that she ends up. And so I think that was a big turning point for me. We ended up doing more with parallels as well, making sure that what she experienced in the beginning of her journey is then kind of paralleled later on. So those were fun things that were turning points for me and things that I definitely hadn't thought of of my own. Maybe I would have gotten there at some point, but not sure. One thing that I often say about works that are sci-fi or fantasy is that it is so hard to make it clear to someone who doesn't know your world yet. And I remember us working a lot on clarity. Do you remember any of that? Yes, I do. And I think especially when I went back and reread the, the first draft I went with, I did with you, I think I realized how much I'd worked on clarity. And, um, and I think sometimes I can confuse clarity with length. I don't think that they're necessary, necessarily in synonymous. They're intertwined. But I think I thought, oh, well, I'll just cut some, cut some sentences or cut some words. But that's really not where the clarity comes in. It's about making sure that everything you're emphasizing needs to be there and everything's important and serves a purpose. And I think Caitlin and I were actually talking about this today where we were saying that every word choice matters. They evoke different images and evoke different feelings for people. So I think that that matters so much in a query when someone may only read your first paragraph or may only absorb that first paragraph. So I do remember that. <laughs> I mean, I'm curious if we're at the stage where we should read I was just thinking the, the that. work. Yes. Um, Julia, would you please read us version one? Yes. So this version was from April, I believe, 
So I'm going to go ahead and read it. You'll notice some similarities, but definitely some differences. <laughs> Dear Agent, I'm excited to send you Trial by Sea and Spirits, a young adult fantasy complete at 94,000 words with serious potential. It combines the enchantingly dangerous setting and sibling bonds of Emily J. Taylor's Hotel Magnifique and the generational family secrets of All the Stars and Teeth by Adeline Grace. This book features a crucible setting, found family, and a major character with a chronic illness inspired by my own. 17-year-old Rosaline Roe DeMarcus never holds back when raising spirits of the dead, even if it might spare her some trouble. As a morphic, a descendant of witches, Roe must pass a high-stakes trial to keep her treasured morphia magic. Failure means single-handedly disgracing her esteemed family and ruining her plans to follow in her deceased brother's footsteps as a hunter of dangerous morphics. That is, unless she's willing to serve a punishment sentence on the celestial cruise ship, a vessel that keeps extracted magic out of the realm for a chance at a retrial. To Rose horror, she fails her trial and makes the difficult choice to join the staff on board. Seeing as her family was responsible for creating the trials and ship that protects the realm, the shame is almost unbearable. High-paying guests experience the thrill of Morphia magic without limits, but the Morphic staff compete to earn guest votes for a retrial. Between starry shades of magic and extravagance, bosses chop appendages for mistakes and hallways attack workers after dark. Now labeled a dangerous morphic herself, Rose thrust into a twisted popularity contest against staff members who are more experienced and just as desperate. While serving as personal concierge to a family of pretentious guests, Roe receives help from a talented aerial silks performer with the ability to shift his painted nails into claws. With charm and frustrating honesty, he makes her question the purpose of the ship and the legacy of her family. When Roe is framed for a guest's murder, she realizes that the only way she'll escape the celestial alive and with her magic is by challenging the rules she once believed in and her family who helped create them. And then the bio. It's a good bio. Read the bio. <laughs> okay. I am a graduate student in mental health counseling with a tendency to scribble plot points in the margins of my school notes. I am a member of SCWBI Manuscript Academy, and I live with my twin sister in Orlando, Florida. When I'm not writing, you can find me on local weekend adventures and adding to my growing wall of bookish fan art. I love that. Okay, so I am looking at my notes here. So when I went through this, I was I was reading this at the same pace as an agent would a query inbox. So it was like, okay, here's this, here's this, here's this. My first note is that I liked the opening. I think that was really interesting. I wasn't sure what Never Holds Back meant. There was the high stakes trial. I was wondering if that happened to everybody at certain ages. Julia, are you okay with me actually? Actually sh sharing not just your query, but my notes on it too, so people can follow along. Oh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay, great. Um, so I was just having little questions throughout, like, why are we going into theoretical punishment if this hasn't happened yet? I'm wondering if it was just for stakes. I wondered what kind of punishment it was. I wondered what kinds of difficult choices. A lot of this is in the hypothetical. And we talked a lot about that, how all of this could be stakes that are possible, but not necessarily going to happen no matter what. Just so much to take apart here. So let's just go through a lot of this. We were talking about, I had a lot of questions about how everything worked, why it was all working, why her family created a system where people get chopped up. And we talked about all of that. So how did we address all of those questions? Yeah. So first of all, even just reading it, I think I even go, whoa, this is a lot. So um, I think that it was a lot of deciding to put more concrete examples of what she was going through, rather than, like you said, keeping so much of it in the hypothetical. I think that there was a lot of questions because there's always going to be questions and queries because you can't possibly put everything in there. But the problem is I was opening up the door for so many questions that it's like there may not be a reason to have all those things in there if you can't answer them in that query. And I think, too, another thing that I really wanted to keep in mind as well was if you were having all those questions, somebody else was, too. So really emphasizing what that trial, what that trial was like, what, you know, I think we have a little comparison in our future query to kind of give people an image of, oh, OK, I, I can see what this trial is like in this world. And um, what are those bad things that happen and what are the beautiful things that are there? And I think, too, really showcasing her journey, not just as a staff member, but also as a person, you know, who she how she essentially transforms from this affluent person who's really gotten to be proud of her magic her entire life. And then realizing that now she's serving the same people that she used to invite to her mother's teas or used to be having a ball with. And 
So I think that those were things that really transformed from the first one. If I had gone in and edited this, I would have asked many of the same questions. Just so you know that I, I totally agree with what Jessica said. Sometimes I think with fantasy, you really need to like render down to the core and really stick with your core, you know, messaging. And like, you're right, concrete and stakes really there, but there's other things you can just kind of leave, you know, because once we're living in your world and your manuscript, it's going to come out fine. Oh, exactly. I, it's funny when I start looking at all of the details, even there was a line about her deceased brother and I'm like, oh, that's not in there anymore because you don't need it. Of course, there's that's the fun thing about actually reading the book. You're going to explore so much that isn't in the query. So you don't want to put all of it in there and not leave any surprises. Yeah. I like to talk about the ratio of questions asked to questions answered. And right here, you are raising a lot of questions and not giving us enough answers. So you have to get this balance right, right? You don't want us to be confused if we have too many questions. And you don't want us to feel like we know so much, there's no point in reading the rest because we know everything. Um, and so I guess it could be kind of um, a spectrum. And I would say that you are two thirds of the way into too many questions here. And I love how so much of the clarity can come from, and as I believe you have done in your later drafts, so much of the clarity can come from how your character feels about it. Well, yeah. And I think that there was a lot missing as far as how she was feeling and how this impacted her family, how not only impacting her family as far as them feeling some shame about her, a lot of shame about her having to serve on this cruise ship, but also the fact how much it transforms her as a person to start seeing this system that her family built and realizing that she's somewhat compliant in that she's a DeMarcus. So she's part of this and is a, is a reason for why this is happening. And her realizing that she may not support something that her family created, that she may not support something that she once believed in, that really shakes her very foundation. And so I think that that was something that was missing. And just to clarify, like we're still um, we're still editing this, this new one. So I don't want anyone to think, oh, this is going to be the perfect version I'm about to read next. But I do think that you can really see like a lot of the changes and a lot of the imagery and the concrete examples and that some of that information was pared down. So I am excited to, um, even when I look at it, I'm, I think about how I've seen such a change in the query itself, but also in me believing in myself. So that's definitely a positive thing too. Oh my gosh. I literally can't wait to hear it. Can we just go? I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Before we do, I seem to remember, Julia, that there was a moment when I said, okay, you have all this stuff going on. It's all getting equal emphasis. We need the foreground. We need the background. And here are your four main points. I don't remember what they were. Yes, that was very important to me, too. I'm, I think I even wrote that down. In, I always take notes. And so I'm trying to see if I wrote that down because it was really important having those for one, we had like one, two, three, and four. And what was going in each of those, that was really pivotal as well, because it really, it helped with the clarity, it helped with the focus and really narrowing down what was the purpose of each paragraph. And imagery too. I remember saying, yeah. you don't want this to be a pamphlet for a cruise, but how cool would it be to go on a magical cruise? Gosh, you guys are killing me. I, I feel like you guys are in a special club. <laughs> Sorry. I know. Julie, you're joining the club right now. It's okay. More. <laughs> well, I mean, because that's the thing. Like, the more we're talking about this, like, I was interested. Like, you, like I was totally, like, this is a really interesting premise. But you're right. It's like, it's like, what is the magical way to, like, feed this to us? I, like, I'm already, like, two-thirds of the way there, right? And so I... I, I I can't wait. <laughs> okay, do you want to okay. go ahead and read the newest? Yes, a little nervous, but I will. Dear Agent, 17-year-old Rosaline Roe DeMarcus enchants society's elite at her father's grand balls by raising spirits of the dead. As a morphic, Roe has relished her gift since childhood, conjuring rat spirits to nip at bullies' heels and summoning long-lost grandparents to thrill adoring crowds. Once she passes society's trial to keep her power, like a high-stakes driver's test for magic, she plans to hunt dangerous rogue morphics and make her esteemed family proud. Unbeknownst to Roe, the trial is rigged and she fails. She can either lose her magic or exchange summoning rat spirits for dodging living ones as a staff member on the celestial cruise ship. While affluent guests sample desserts that taste like treasured memories, ride sea dragons on the top deck, and enjoy a starlit theater from floating seats, 
the morphic staff schemed to earn guest votes for a coveted retrial. Rose struggles as concierge to an unforgiving family who would have clamored to attend her father's galas, but the true horrors lurk after her shift ends. At night, the ship enchants crew members to walk off steep balconies and hallway floors swallow workers whole. Confronted with the suffering of most morphics, Roe begins to question her family, whose ancestors created the ship, the trial, and the system that put her there. Her only escape is forbidden nights in the theater with Evander, a handsome aerial silks performer who collects guests' favor with a magnetic smile and his morphic gift to transform his appearance. While learning from his effortless charm to impress even the coldest guest, she's drawn to the corded muscle of his dancer's physique. Within Evander's strong embrace, Roe can let the stress of fighting for a retrial and survival fade. That is, until she's framed for a guest's murder. Trial by Sea and Spirits is a young adult dark romanticy with haunting mystery elements complete at 91,000 words with series potential. It combines the enchantingly dangerous setting and sibling bonds of Emily J. Taylor's Hotel Magnifique and the family secrets and high society of Belladonna by Adeline Grace. This book features a cruise ship setting, found family, and a major character with a chronic illness inspired by my own, followed by the bio. I don't know if you saw it. The difference is like, I was like, um, (laughs) wow, it's so good. It's so good. I don't know if you saw, but when you were like, until she's framed for a guest murder, I was like, yes, because you no, did, I it. did it. You did it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I even just feel a difference reading it. I feel like there's, I get her motivations more. I, I feel like each paragraph like goes together now instead of just everything's in paragraph one, everything's in paragraph two. Each paragraph, I think, says a different thing, which I think is important. And when you do that, now I can remember those four points that I gave you because they're so yeah. clear here. So we've got she's magical. She has a test to pass and she doesn't. Now she's on a cruise ship that's dangerous dealing with the system her family built and also hot aerial silks artists. Those, I believe, are the yeah. four. We didn't even get oh, the Amber. hot aerial silks for her in the first one. <laughs> well, I think, you know what it is? It's it's like a scaffolding. So yeah, so we're just, like as learners, we just want it like information scaffold so we can understand exactly what we're getting into and this was laid out so perfectly i was like i was there and then you twisted the knife and the twist of that knife and and having that one line about the murder just sitting on its own out there in white space just brilliant like really really well done the one line idea was jessica's because in my last draft jessica brilliant she's like i almost missed it julie are you kidding i almost missed that completely that's kind of important so um having it stand on its own was really really cool and just i think automatically piques your interest which is all you need (laughs) well it's like that moment in a movie trailer where like until dun 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 you know like you need you need that and we love that emphasis of that one like until this happens and then you let us and our imaginations fill in the gaps. But on the other hand, before that, you did such a better job filling in what this all looks like, what it feels like, that it's pretty, that it's scary, that she's using magic to do things a typical teen would want to do. So those motivations mm-hmm. are there. Showing what the cruise ship looks like, I think, is really important. Like you were talking about it being dangerous, but like a floor that swallows people, <laughs> way more interesting. But yeah, but there's also a command of, a command of language here. It's so organized. It's so organized so that before I wasn't sure I was truly, totally understanding the world. I'm just going to be honest. I was like, oh, there's a lot of cool stuff in this query. But I wasn't like, wow. It was like, I think Jessica's right. Maybe that's the questioning because my brain wasn't understanding. I was like, ding, 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 you know, but here I'm like, okay, I got it. Oh, I got this. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's like, these are so difficult to do. And by just kind of like playing around with the beats of it, it just makes such a difference for a busy, you know, agent, like, 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 they're really smart, but you also have to give it to them. Absolutely. And I think for me, a big thing that I always wanted to keep in mind was, if you're coming to somebody for a critique, you have to be willing to make those revisions. And I think that that's something I've always done with my books as well. Um, when someone gives me a critique that I really believe they're correct about, and I also believe in, I implement it. And I really do my best to make sure that it's different from where I started. So I think that with the query, it was really important to me that when Jessica says, when Jessica said something I really agreed with and wanted to, to transform, it was like, okay, I'm going to work on this until I think it's different. Like she, um, she suggested parallels last time. So, you know, 
emphasizing at first she's conjuring the rat spirits to nip at Bully's heels, but then when she's going to the ship, she's dodging them in the hallway. So, and then, you know, the, the guests were, may have been people that were at her father's uh, parties and that was mentioned in the first line. So I think that just making sure that if you are, when you are working on your query, there are going to be a lot of revisions. So making sure that you're willing to do that, I think is also important. Are you feeling positive about this third one? Like as far yes. as everything yes. you liked about it? So I did want to mention a few small things. Yeah, um, for sure. Okay. So you mentioned rat spirits kind of a lot of times. Right. <laughs> so- in the second line of the second paragraph, I kind of latched onto the rat imagery without realizing the twist okay. of what you meant there. And when you mentioned it later, I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. So then what if you said something like instead of summoning their spirits at parties, now she's dodging real life rats? So just instead of saying rats multiple times, right? Um, or No, the rats is fine. But I think if you put the emphasis on the change versus the rats. So if you said like um, instead of using them as a party trick, now she's dodging real real rats on the cruise ship. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a way to just like put the emphasis on the contrast. Because right oh, okay. now the way that it is laying out now. The oh, I on see that. You're right. You're right. I see what you're saying. Yes, that makes perfect sense. I, I see what you're saying now. Because yeah, I think that is a really cool thing to do. And then let's see, I had something else in the beginning. Uh, I was a dazzled by it. I didn't pick any of these things up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I liked because I know we had talked about uh, a high stakes drivers test for magic. I think that is very clear. I don't know. Okay. I, to me, it was like a maybe because okay, I'll be honest. Caitlin always wants me to ask you about that line because she's not sure about it. She's I'm not, not so, sure either. So maybe cut that. I feel like it's a little bit on the lengthy side anyway. So maybe we can just cut that line. Or maybe Um, there's another way you can lead us to that conclusion without actually saying it. So maybe if you say something like every 16 year old has to show that she can safely operate magic and do a three point turn or something like that. Like, you know, not exactly. I kind of like that idea though. Every 17 year old has to show that. Yeah. I think we can do something. And if you borrow some car words, like operate safely, come to a stop, I don't know, whatever, whatever they do on driver's test. I haven't driven in like 10 years. In a while. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think, I think then people, then if people, if there's a way that you can make people be like, oh, it's like a driver's test then. Yeah. And I think it's, it's been a little bit of a pause for Caitlin and I. So I think transforming it a little may help. The, The one other question I had for you was, as far as the list of three things, as far as like describing the cruise ship, mm-hmm. do you think it's too much and I should just use two or did you like all three? The problem is I love um, all three, but I'm just wondering. Those? Let's see. Uh, um, it's in the second desserts, paragraph. Uh, sea yeah. dragons. I would say the sea, gra- sea dragons do the least for me. Okay. I and like that- the... I don't mind the driver's test thing. I think it makes it seem kind of fun. It is very clear. It is very clear. I could go either way on the driver's test thing, honestly. I, I, I actually, I think it's I think it's a nice addition. I don't know. Okay. Just so, so if you're playing back and forth, I think send out some with, some out some without. That's a great idea. You know, yeah, you like, can A-B test you it. You can A-B test it. How, um, Julie, how do you feel about the list um, of imagery? I loved it. I, th- I mean, I'm a screenwriting teacher. I have been for the last five years. Um, so I, anytime that I can really, like, I can organize images in my head like that, I, it makes it, it grounds it for me. Okay. I like the imagery. I think if you were going to cut one, I'd get rid of the sea dragons because those could look so many different ways. It's so funny because if we were going to cut one, that's the one we said as well. So okay. we're on the same wavelength. But okay. I'm not sure because I do, I'm in love with the list, but at the same time, just for length and wondering how much they can hold in there, like in yes. at one time. Yes. I think, I think. For me, because of the fact it's so organized, I can hold a lot because because it's almost like I have a file folder for each chunk and the file folder is like, okay, it starts with this and then it moves to this and then yes. it's this and then, oh, and this is who this person is. Like, it's really organized. Well, and I think I could always send out, you know, a few like this. And then if I'm not getting any responses, maybe I can, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. tweak it a little bit and yeah. make some I mean, changes. I mean, I think you're going to get hits with this. I think so I too. Hope so. Is Caitlin really serious so. about wanting to be an agent? I could mention it, but I think she's she works in hotels right now. So she really loves doing that. But she definitely loves aspects of it for sure. I think it's just the long, I hate to say it, but you guys work really long hours without breaks, right? Yep. I think that's the only part she wouldn't like as much. But I could mention it to her that maybe she could send yeah. an email. 
Yeah, if she if she has questions, she can get in touch. Actually, that would be really funny if we had like the two of you on to be writer hat and agent hat for. Well, you know, she always says she's like one day, you know, if you're, you know, an author, she's like, I could do your events or do your uh, that kind of stuff. Because in hotels, she's she's kind of like their sales and um, uh, also has some like work in events. So that's really cute. She's always she's always like one day, you know, we'll do this together. Oh, my gosh. So nice. I'm just so proud of you. Like, you took feedback and ran with it. Like, you know, there is everybody from, like, the folks who fight you when you give you when you give them feedback. Fine, whatever. If that's when, how you want to spend the time, go for it. Um, they're the people who are like, yes, totally, and then do nothing. Um, there are the people who um, do a little bit. And then there are the people who take the little bit of advice you give them and they just run with it. And that is you. How did you learn how to do that? Well, I think with the book I wrote uh, the work I wrote and queried before this one, I, I actually ended up hiring an editor because I'd self-edited my previous manuscripts, but I just thought, you know, I can only do what I know how to do. So I went and got an editor and she gave me a developmental edit. And I thought, okay. And I took that developmental edit and I completely transformed that book. And I also did a line edit with her for that book. And it taught me so much. So I think that and every time I would send her back a draft, I only did, you know, one, one send back, but she would just tell me, this is so different. And you absolutely implemented everything I did. So I think just learning from that experience, working with an editor for that previous book, I was able to do that in every book since. So it's something that once you learn to do something once and you go, okay, I know how to do this now, you're then able to do that for yourself later on. So, and not everybody has the means to hire an editor. So maybe that's just a really great beta reader who, you know, helps you or your sister who is really um, also reads a ton of young adult fantasy and is able to give me edits. But every time I work on a book, I learn. And I think that if you're just writing at the same level for every book, then that's disappointing. You want every book to be better. I think just by working at it is how I was able to implement edits and feedback. Do you have any advice on handling rejection? Well, I think my advice, it may sound like something everyone's heard before, but it's just to keep going. Because I think that there's always this thought when you first start out, definitely in middle school and high school, when I was first starting, I had this thought that I'm going to write a great book and I'm going to get an agent and I'm going to get published. But I think when you enter the reality, you realize that a great book isn't enough. It's going to be a great book with lots of hard work, lots of probably it may not be your first book that gets you signed with anyone or even just gets you to finish. Some people may not finish their first book. So I think just continuing in that process and realizing that it's a lot of luck, a lot of timing. Um, I've seen incredible writer friends that maybe they still don't have an agent. I'm sitting here like, what? how do you not have that? But it's because it's just this, this perfect meld of everything. So you just have to wait for your timing. I think that that's something and to be okay when you get discouraged. So I'm my graduate programs in the mental health field. So I'm definitely learning about having self-compassion, doing your self-care. Um, I'm not going to lie and say that querying can't it's not the most discouraging process. It can be very discouraging. So I definitely think that you should take your time when you do feel really discouraged to step away. This book I wrote, the book that I'm querying now is actually the book that I wrote while I was querying my previous one. It was my distraction project. And I got so excited by it that I wrote the first draft in a month and a half. So that's what Camp NaNoWriMo, I think, had a lot to do with that. I set a goal of 50,000 words in July And so I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I think that just realizing when it's your time, continuing to work at it and um, just not giving up even when you're discouraged, but knowing that it's okay to take a break. I love the idea of almost having little pockets of time when you can focus on something that isn't your official project. So whether you are writing something new or crocheting a blanket or learning how to cook or just doing something else that isn't in that normal linear, how do you do everything as fast and efficiently as possible? I think that is a lovely break for us in terms of taking care of our creative selves. Yeah, I think that continuing to work on the same project can be really helpful, but it is so important because that's that's 
the piece of it that keeps us all coming back. No matter how much discouragement you face or how many years you've been doing this, we love writing. You can't stay away. And I think that's what's happened for me because I've been so dedicated to this since for, I know I'm young, but for a long time for me, um, like since high school that I think it's tempting sometimes to think, oh, would it be easier not to have this dream? Would it be easier to want to do something else? But the fact that I love writing so much and I love writing books, it just keeps keeps me coming back. I almost this is a wild idea. I and not necessarily a good idea. Um, <laughs> I almost want. When are you planning to send this out? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I don't have an exact date. I think I'm just gonna see how we feel about this version, and then. Um, I mean, I hope. I hope by at least next month or like the end of this month. I don't know. Okay, this is not a good idea at all, but I have to throw it out there. What if, in addition to your previous versions of your queries, we had a live scoreboard of queries sent? Queries, <laughs> no, that's a terrible idea. I Wouldn't it be funny if someone did have a live scoreboard? It would be wonderful if it all happened so fast. In the world. But I think it would be really like, oh no, if all we're seeing is rejection. <laughs> But also every writer does, right? You know, no matter what, everyone's going to get rejections. I really think that if it was like a basketball game with a giant scoreboard and we could see and get a little ping every time you get a request and we could be like, yeah, you know, or, you know, if there was a rejection and we're like, boo, and then we have like little chants and we're like stamping in the seats and we're like, you know, that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge about basketball. But it would be great. If- Mine too. <laughs> It would just be so lovely if we could cheer along with you too. And I know that I think like- finding people to cheer along with you is so important. And I think that's why I love Manuscript Academy so much. Even if you just go to like uh, one of the classes at night or one of the live events, everyone in the comments is so supportive. And you see all these people who also have this really difficult dream. And they're also here trying to learn and create this community. So I think And Jessica, I think you too, like just giving you credit as well. You've encouraged me so much. Just offering to do this has been such like a bright spot for me. And it's so powerful to give people in this position hope and someone else who believes in them. So I'm just so thankful for everything you have done as far as just taking time with me and just offering to say, sure, bring this query back again. I'd like to see it again. And I can just so see the difference from now and that first one. (laughs) Well, it's interesting because it's like you think about things that give you energy, things that take it away. For some reason, talking with you gives me energy back. I don't know how you do that, but like (laughs) it's not everybody. (laughs) Some people just fight with me the whole time, which again, it's okay. That's your choice. (laughs) But And I imagine people out there can hear this too. There is something about the way that you talk about work that is really compelling and uplifting and optimistic. And it makes me feel like you have the energy to keep going. It's impressive you've gotten here already. I know you say, you know, for you, it's a long time to be writing. It is a large percentage of your life that you've been writing. So I think it's just very impressive that you are so willing to be like, okay, here's the feedback. Let's take it and run with it. And honestly, just the hope and open-mindedness of like, let's try this and see how it works out. But it's worth a try. Thank you. And absolutely. Yeah, I love anytime I get feedback that I feel like is going to make something better. That's why editing is so fun because you get to look at this draft and go, I get to make this better. And every time you read it, it's going to be better. It may not be perfect, but it's going to get better. I think if the, for the agents out there, I think Julia is the full package. <laughs> Like you are confident, you're well-spoken, you try hard, you believe in the process, you ha- you believe in revision, you're positive. I mean, there's so many indicators I, and I guess we've never really done that. Like what are the indicators that that you see? I'm just going to put this to Jessica. What are, the, are those, like, is there anything I'm missing or, as an indicator of what you would like to see in a client? Oh, it's all there. Yeah. <laughs> I get the general sense that like, I think Julia is resilient. I think that is a huge part of it. I think it's that no matter what happens, <laughs> say the submission process puts you, your agent and a, your book in a box. It's going to shake that box everywhere. <laughs> And we need to know you're not going to get broken in shipping. (laughs) So I just get the feeling that whatever happens to that box, you know, UPS drops it down the stairs. I think you're going to be okay. And that to me is like a really good sign in terms of, well, lack of stress for me too, right? Like I want my clients to, well, I guess just looking ahead, I imagine what the conversations would be like, right? Mm -hmm. And I think with Julia, it would always be fun. It would be very little (laughs) fighting about edits. (laughs) 
It would be okay. very it would be very little. No, I didn't mean that. I meant that. Like you just seem to understand what I'm talking about, which is lovely. And I'm not saying you'd have that with every single agent. Like you'd have to find the right one to have those conversations with. But also, you know, I feel like you're starting from a place where hard things can happen and you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And that I think is very attractive in a client because of course I want my clients to be okay, but I'm always going to worry if I don't have that sense going in. I think for me too, one of the things that keeps me feeling more resilient is the fact that I'm somebody who I'm always thinking of the next idea. So like, I just, I don't know if you got, you probably already know, obviously, but I just got the Save the Cat for like young adult books because I've always used Save the Cat, but I just got the young adult version. And so, um, you know, I'm already like, outlining my next one. So I think it's just that process of like, okay, if this one doesn't work, I'm going to write the next one. I'm going to write the next one. I'm going to write the next one. So, and I'm always excited to do that. Even though I may not always be excited about clearing again, I'm always excited to write and polish the next one. So I think that's what keeps me going, even when things get difficult. Like what is your strategy for um, sending this query out? Are you going to do batches of 10? Are you going to do a huge list? Are you going to start with your dream agent? Are you going to... Like, how is this going to work for you? Yeah, so I'm definitely a batches person, more for even my mental state than um, even necessarily a strategy purpose. I think it's just, you know, I can only handle so much rejection at once. And I think it still gives me an opportunity that if somebody did have time to give me feedback, I could still implement that. So I'm definitely a batches person. Caitlin and I create the list together and Caitlin usually does like the initial research and then I go through and because it doesn't stress her out at all to look at it. (laughs) So she does like kind of that initial pass of who she really likes and who basically everyone on manuscript wish list that kind of is looking for something that I might be able to provide. And then I go through and kind of narrow it down. I think it's honestly, especially now also just seeing who's open. I think that that kind of determines who I'm going to submit to as well. I also, I love the term dream agent because it's just so exciting, but I think it's kind of hard as someone who doesn't know those agents or you don't know just because they did something for someone else, if they're necessarily going to mesh with you. I think that I don't know if I necessarily have a dream agent list more, probably more of just a hopeful list and then see if we mesh later on. But yeah, that's kind of my, my strategy. I think that a big piece of that strategy is going to just stay on top of myself to make sure that I am sending this out soon. Because I think it's, you know, I have this philosophy that it's like, when you don't send it out, when you haven't sent it out yet, anything can happen. And once you set it out, the reality kind of starts to set back in. So I think I'm holding on to the dreamy fantasy world just a little bit longer. But I think it's really time to get in the reality because it can take so long to get an agent that if I don't start now, nothing bad can happen, but nothing good can happen either. So that's well, kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. As you go on the journey, I think that is such a smart way to look at it. And I agree. Some people are like, this is the agent. This is the agent for me. Right. And then they meet with them sometimes and they're like, I don't know, our vibes didn't match up. I think it is such like an energetic exchange. So knowing um, how you want to feel with your agent, you know, along with sales and everything else, because it is a partnership. Absolutely. Yeah. And I appreciate that you're open to the possibility of having a conversation that will change how you feel about that agent, will change how you feel about where your work is going, how you're going to edit. I'm just excited for you. I wish I could just be like a cute little fly on the wall listening to you having these chats with these agents. And like, I'm so curious about, will you get along with everybody? Probably. Will someone suggest something that's awful? Maybe, probably not. You know, like, I'm just, I'm so curious about how all of that is going to go. I really hope to be able to give you some good news. And I I would love to just get that feeling of excitement at just seeing a full request or seeing someone else who's excited about the book. So I, I'm excited too. I think that doing this process with you has made me much more excited than I would have been. First of all, the query wouldn't have been as good. But second of all, I think I just wouldn't have had as much hope and excitement going forward. And it it is nice to feel like I have you, Jessica, and you, Julie, like also rooting for me. That's a wonderful feeling. And if you ever did know anyone that was looking for something like this, definitely let me know. (laughs) But either way, I'm going to keep you in touch for sure and let you know how it's all going. It sounds like Caitlin will find him anyway. I know, right? Right? (laughs) I'm I can only imagine what your dating life is like. It's <laughs> wingman. That's nope. funny. Yes. No. Nope. Yes. Yes. No. Nope. Yeah. Caitlin's like, I found his stepsister. She doesn't like him. <laughs> oh, so funny. 
That's amazing. <laughs> Wait, where is Caitlin now? Is Caitlin? A- <laughs> oh, no, Caitlin's at work. I wish she could pop in, but no, she's at work. She loves her job. But I will say right before this call, she was like, Julia, you can call me and talk through some of the questions if you want. And we talked oh. about it. So she's she's very much a part of everything I do and is honestly the best person in my life. So that's so nice. Well, keep <laughs> us posted on everything. Hopefully we'll have a launch podcast for you. You know, when this yes. Debut, yes. when your debut is finally out. So yep. Can't wait to give out some copies to those audience members. Woo. Uh, in the meantime, if you happen to be an agent looking for YA fantasy and you happen to notice that Julia is awesome, yeah, you can ask us to put you in touch with her. We're happy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Julia, I'm just so preemptively happy for you. Thank you so much. No matter what happens with this book or this process, I'm really proud of everything I've learned and everything that I've done to get this query from where it was in the beginning to where it is now. I've definitely learned a lot. Julia, I'm so happy for you. Please, please, please send an email when you're like, okay, I sent it out. You can also trick your brain, you know, a way to trick your brain if you don't want to send something. Mm -hmm. You can put it in your Gmail and schedule it for some time in the future. And if you don't come up with some reason that you shouldn't send it, it just kind of quietly goes out. That's a great. I lo- it's kind of like uh, in therapy, we give people homework. You're kind of giving me homework right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, so this, make sure you make sure you stay on top of it. And I, that's really important because I can push things off a bit just because, you know, I'm a little bit afraid of the result. But I think that that's a really good plan. No, I know awesome. what you mean. Until you do it, you feel like anything could happen. And when you yeah. start doing it. The first word rock, you're probably going to be like, <gasps> yeah, okay. it's just your heart drops a little. And then you just you really have to buckle down and just keep going. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes like make a grid and give yourself, OK, what, if I send out five of these, I'm going to do this. Yes. Like, right. And so person. and so it's almost like a behavior modification. Exactly. I'm going to do that. this. But then today I'm going to do I'm going to go to the pet That's shop and pet these dogs and I'm going to like whatever. Definitely distraction. A big deal. Sure. But it's it's like any way we can trick our brain to for positive habits because like in the end a rejection doesn't really matter it hurts but like you're safe yeah <laughs> like you you know what i mean it's, it's inevitable <laughs> it is it's just part of the business so it is and i think it's one of those things where you can't even you can't possibly work with everyone so it's like if you get 20 caitlin always makes that joke she's like julia can you imagine if you got multiple people interested she's like well, you'd be having a whole other problem So, you know, you're having to decide. So I think it's almost, you'll, I'll find the right person, I think. Yeah, but the more, but that's the better your query, the more you're apt to have that problem. So, you know, we all, we all welcome that that problem. problem. I'll be honest, I'll welcome it. (laughs) If you get stuck with that problem, drop us a line. Happy to walk you through it. Yes, I would appreciate that so much. Thank you both for everything. And I'll definitely, I'll I'll send an email when I send the first ones out just to, keep you both updated. Yes. Good. Yeah. So you can schedule that to us too. Be like, Hey, here's my scheduled email. My scheduled like submissions are going out. Yay. (laughs) And then we'll cheer for you from home. Even if we don't have a scoreboard. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Julia, thank you so much. Cannot wait to hear more. (laughs) Me too. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye now. We are so glad that you joined us. And as always, we appreciate your feedback. Just head on over to the iTunes store and let us know what you think. It not only helps us make this podcast be the best it can be, but it also affects our ratings within the iTunes platform. We'd love to hear from you. If you're feeling brave and want to submit your page for our first pages podcast, you can send it to academy at manuscriptwishlist.com with first pages podcast in the subject line. We'd also just love to hear from you. And if you'd like to learn more about the Manuscript Academy and everything we have to offer, just jump on over to manuscriptacademy.com.